Um, so we're going to be talking about um, whether creative writing can or not be taught. Uh, it's quite a contentious issue, and I've encouraged all the speakers to be argumentative and to make this a really kind of um, lively discussion. Um, I thought I'd open with um, a very brief talk, um, well, a, a very brief reading of something I wrote for the um, University of East Anglia's 40-year uh, anthology that was published a few years ago. And for those of you who uh, know the University of East Anglia, they were the first university in the UK to teach creative writing at degree level. And they published this anthology where lots of different writers who taught and, and studied with them talked about the practice of creative writing. So I thought I'd, I'd begin uh, with a sort of a, a, a brief reading of some of what I wrote just to set the tone, and then we can take it from there. <clears throat> we know how story works from our earliest listening and reading experiences. Young children know that a story has a beginning, middle, and end, although they can't articulate it. But try not finishing a good story you're telling an under five-year-old. They know a story has characters, whether they are human, animal, or even tank engines, and they enjoy the suspense of wondering what happens next. They want what's read to them to excite their minds, imaginations, and emotions, as do we all. At a deeper level, creative writing fulfills a, hun a fundamental human need for narrative. It's about communication and a means by which we understand ourselves and our lives. Through storytelling, we connect the generations. We become keepers of our histories, personal, family, communal, cultural, racial, religious, national, global. We transform our experiences and transcend them. Our conversations are peppered with stories, whether anecdotal or more convoluted, with elaborations, omissions, interpretations, and judgments. To study the telling of stories, therefore, is to engage with something that is integral to who we are. In 1999, I taught a course for the British Council for rural women in Zimbabwe who had never written creatively before. Through their writing, it emerged that all of them had relatives and neighbors who had died from AIDS. This was a taboo subject in Zimbabwe. But in this workshop setting, it became an issue to be aired, shared, and discussed. The women were able to transform a national epidemic and their own personal tragedies into individualistic, deeply felt stories. Out of suffering came creativity and solace. In 2003, I was a visiting professor at Barnard College in New York. The young undergraduates came from mostly privileged, sheltered, suburban backgrounds. In our first session together, they wrote stories about pajama parties and the trauma of being denied a horse as a child. I groaned inwardly as I contemplated a whole term of this. But by the end of the course, they were writing carefully researched, imaginatively crafted stories set in Imperial China, Revolutionary Russia, Nazi Germany, as well as subjects closer to home. The course helped transform them from young women with limited experience of the world to young women able to see beyond their own concerns, engage with important periods of history, and bring them alive in fiction. They had moved from the present to the past, the parochial to the international. They were growing up. A course in Saudi Arabia in 2006, also for the British Council, was different again. When the students, all female, of course, in this segregated society, entered the class draped head to toe in purda, I panicked as I wondered how I was going to teach without seeing their faces. Thankfully, slowly, they started to unravel some of the layers. They were all university students, but living in a police state where literature is heavily censored and mostly unavailable were not your usual student demographic. It was a challenge getting them to express themselves openly, not least because they were suspicious that their fellow students would inform on them. The short stories they wrote were heavily self-censored, but even for them, studying creative writing opened their eyes to the possibility of creative freedom. Finally, I taught an intergenerational creative writing course in Suffolk a few years ago. In my workshop, school children from a poor part of Ipswich and local pest pensioners studied together as equals. 
The youngest was 11, <clears throat> the oldest was in his 80s, and writing allowed them all to be heard in a society that usually doesn't take them seriously or doesn't listen. For the school children, all their most pressing concerns, anger at parents, serious dysfunction at home, homophobia, religious beliefs, or outrage at social injustice were addressed and articulated through poetry and fiction. Some of the older people had never written creatively before and trawled eagerly through their memory banks to write about the past and their experiences of love and loss. One woman, who described herself with some resignation as a wife, mother, and daughter, said it was the first time in decades she'd done something just for herself. She discovered through her poetry that not only did she have things to say that were unique to her, but she had a natural flair for writing. Her sense of identity began to shift. In America, most published writers are graduates of creative writing degrees, and this is increasingly the case in the UK. Creative writing courses not only help equip people with the skills needed to be a writer, but are also shaping what is being published. If we accept that literature deepens and transforms human experience, nourishes our imagination and intellect, stirs our emotions, and can cause us to reflect, question, expand and engage with lives and realities other than our own, then we must also accept that creative writing teaching plays a vital and indispensable part in the health of our national and cultural lives. So I've laid my cards on the table. <laughs> so actually, I think I'll turn to Sharon first. Because, because I don't know Sharon, and um, I know that she hasn't, I don't think she studied creative writing in a formal setting, yet she's published very successfully. So I'd like to ask you how you would address the question, should creative writing be taught? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Actually, yesterday when um, the panel discussion on creative ways or new ways into publishing uh, was on, I suddenly had this feeling that I'd chosen the wrong discussion. <laughs> I was like, oh, I should have been on yesterday's one. But I don't have a definitive answer to this question. I, I, I'm kind of hoping that as we speak, that lots of different uh, facets and nuances will come up and then maybe I'll have a clearer answer at the end of the discussion. But I have some, some thoughts. I think definitely, for example, uh, certain techniques can be taught and certain crafts, craftsmanship. Um, but I'm not sure you can teach talent if, I don't even know how you would define talent, but to teach someone something that they have in themselves, I'm not sure how that would work. I was wondering if I actually had a problem with the word teaching and whether um, I would answer the question differently if it was, can it be learnt? And I would say definitely, yes, you can learn creative writing. Um, I have sometimes um, on occasion um, run creative writing workshops myself and I felt like I was something like a coach rather than a teacher. Um, and I wonder also about hierarchies in education. And for example, when I was young, I, I, I loved to write and I often wrote poems and short stories. And I sometimes brought them in and showed them to my teachers at school. And I had this very bad experience once where a teacher told me that what I'd written was boring. And it, it, it kind of killed my creativity for a long time. And so I, I just have these questions in my mind about who, is, who has the authority to tell somebody else that what they're doing is good or, or very creative or really creative. Um, yeah, those are my initial thoughts on the question. Uh, thank you. So I'll ask Catherine now. <laughs> this one? Hello? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I too don't have a formal uh, academic... I mean, you know, I did exams at A-level, but I never thought I could write. I do work with a lot of young people pre-university. I have taught at university, but a lot of my experience is at school level. And actually... What I find, well, in the UK at least, is that the way that writing is taught, it's not taught at all creatively. It is taught you, to pass exams. So what you, you get, even talking to very young children, like 11-year-olds, oh, yes, but miss, you see, I've put this fronted adverbial and I've used these wow words. And it's not, it's about showing off your vocabulary and not 
writing a story that somebody would be interested in. So it's about ramming it full of words, which, so it's like word soup, you know, it's sort of the Donald Trump of, of storytelling. And what you have to, what you get then is that you have to unlearn. I think if you want to write a, a story that someone wants to read, you have to strip all that out. Yeah. So for me, it's always been that creative writing is not like academic writing. And I think for a lot of people, you were saying who's got the authority to say what is, you know, you can be a good writer and be rubbish at schoolwork. That, that's what I try and encourage when I talk to young people, that, you know, telling stories is not, I mean, this is, a, it's sort of slightly tangential to all this. I think, you, like you said, craft. And it's also talking to other people who take writing seriously. I think that's what's important. I first went to, this is so long ago, Hackney Council Women's Group with a Crash. Uh, it was very important, <laughs> with a crash. And um, it was really about people sharing stuff. Uh, and building confidence, because I think what creative writing is, you, you know, you have to be confident about what you're doing. And so the, the teaching and the learning thing, it's more really about providing space, providing scaffolding, providing a way for people to share and allowing them to share. Because we all know, if you've been in writing for any amount of time, a lot of people... You know, there's always the conflict between sort of bosiness, you know, that some published writers are. You know, and that, you know, yes, I'm allowed to say whatever I want, but actually some of the most interesting stories, that's not where they come from. So, and listening to all the panels yesterday, listening to you, Malika, and uh, talking about networks and support, and that, to me, has always been really important that sort of validation that you get from a, say, a space with other writers in and having your writers taken ser taking s seriously. So I think while the idea of, of a three-year or an MA... An MA is more like space to write your novel, isn't it, really? Uh, more than that. Yeah? It's more than that, yeah. I can talk about it in a bit. Okay. But so if you look at... Under I've only taught on an undergraduate courses and it's very different... It's, it is more of that we're trying things out. But I don't know. I don't know. I think it would be good if there were other experiences as well. I think you need lots of stuff to go in in order to get stuff out. And whether those are experiences in the real world. So, you know, doing a creative writing degree at 19, I'm not sure. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, Irenison. Yeah, I don't, there's no right or wrong answer for this. Um, I think similarly, I think it can, it can be learnt and it can be taught. But um, I mean, I run workshops occasionally, but I don't see myself as a teacher. I see myself as a facilitator. So again, it's that thing of giving people access, um, giving people permission, creating a space for them to feel like they can tell their stories, they can share, and they can learn from each other. Um, so a couple of years back, when I first started writing, I was kind of at a, a crossroads in terms of, do I try and do a course um, at UEA, or do I just sort of learn myself from other writers? Um, and I decided against the UEA course, and I'll tell you why. Even though it provided structure, I felt like what, what happens in England is you, you get lots of writers coming out through that, through that process, but perhaps being taught in a particular way. And I didn't want that for my writing. I kind of wanted to discover what my writing would be like, just kind of organically learning from other writers, which I think is just as, just as important. Um, and then I did a, a program with Spread the Word. Spread the Word are a writing development agency in, in London. And that was structured, but quite loosely. So I sort of, and it was free as well, more importantly. Uh, the UA course is quite expensive. Um, so that had a structure to it, but it was fluid. And it was more about, you know, the mentor looking at the work every now and again and then feeding back to you. And then you just having that one-to-one -one attention. Um, 
so yeah, so at that point in my life, I felt like that was the, the right decision. But for some people, you know, I have friends who, who do writing courses, um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, you know, you, there is something in that. There is something in learning from someone who's very skilled at, at what they do and being within that structure and feeling like you are developing your craft. You are, you know, you're growing as a writer. But for me, I wanted the much more organic loose experience because it was just it just felt more interesting to me you know just to go out and do it felt more interesting to me and then I would like provide myself with support support systems and networks and and tap into those as and when I needed it so it's, it's different for everybody but that's yeah that's my initial response um, Devil's the <coughs> advocacy to say as well which is the other thing because I'm not a you know it's if you need an MA to write a novel. Why are you writing a novel? <laughs> okay, so um, very provocative, Catherine. <laughs> so, you know, going back to what you were saying about, um, uh, you know, 19 year olds with no experience, the thing is, creative writing is taught to people who don't necessarily want to be writers but they're interested in the subject and they, they have then develop what we call transferable skills in the academy uh, where they go out and they use those skills to do marketing or advertising or to work in theatre or, or become um, cultural attaches or something. I bet if you ask all those kids that come in, some of them might be sensible enough to say, no, I don't want to be a writer. I, I bet all of them, <coughs> at the back of their mind, because... Didn't we all, you all want to walk in a bookshop and see a book with your name on it? And I, I, I sort of don't, why would you I do I mean, that? Uh, yeah, but the thing is, I think, I think, maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe initially they go in, they think, oh, they're going to be writers. And then at some point, they're, well, I, actually, I don't know. I don't know. But I, if, if they do want to be writers, often they don't admit to that even on a creative writing degree. But in any case, they go in there and because they're interested in literature, they want to, they want to write. They don't want to do an English literature degree, although, of course, they can do a joint. A lot of people do a joint English literature with creative writing degree, or they joint with games design in, in, the, in my university or, or joint with theatre. Um, and what the course offers them is not the experience that we know writers need, although some writers, like you mentioned, Helen Oyemi, published when she was 17, not the experience that we know they need that's going to really enrich their work and, and, and give it the depth <coughs> that it could have, but they learn, they enjoy the course, most importantly, and they learn the skills that you need to be a writer. You cannot teach talent, right, for sure, but you can nurture it. You can, you, you've mentioned confidence, you can give them, a, you can help them to realize whatever talent and potential they have inside of themselves. Creative writing taught at university level, so we have, uh, you know, uh, the first degree, second degree, we have PhDs. I've got, actually got a PhD in creative writing, but I got it extremely late. I'd already written loads of books and so on. Um, is very structured and for a, a good course, well, part of it will be reading. You have to read at the same time. So every course that you take, you are reading. So one of the arguments against creative writing is that people should really go off and do an English degree. And then after that, they should then consider themselves sort of semi-trained to be writers. But in actual fact, a good creative writing degree, an integral part of it is reading. And the reading is often to deconstruct the text, or the viewing, if, it's, if they're studying drama or, or screenplays, it's to deconstruct the text from a craft point of view to see how it works. So if we look at fiction, you know, we have characterization, we have structure, we have setting, we have dialogue, we have point of view, we have all these little things that have developed names as the, as, as the subject has been taught. So you probably, I didn't know those necessarily, think of those when I was writing. You probably didn't either, Catherine, because you didn't come up through the academy, right? So you just wrote these stories and you did think of characters, but you didn't, weren't necessarily breaking it down in the way in which it's broken down now, because in order to teach it, we need to label it and name it and so on and so forth. So they learn all the craft and the techniques. Some of them become very proficient at it. As you said, Arenison, some of them, are very proficient, they do very well, they publish books, but they haven't got that spark. They don't write what you write. You know, Irenison has a warped and twisted imagination. I told her that today. 
you know. She and said, you <laughs> seem so nice on the surface, and then she like, seems so innocent she, and like, sweet. I see you completely differently now. <laughs> she really no, but I did before when I read the book. But she really, she really does have that kind of imagination. Would that get through a creative writing course? Where, if if it depends on how it's set up, who's teaching it? Every course, every single module students take is different, depending on who's teaching it. That's what I worried about when I first started writing and was like. Um, not that I, I knew that I had this voice then, but like the, the early seeds of it were starting to show. And um, I thought it was like interesting, but I worried that if I did a course that it wouldn't be seen as the right way to write, that it would have to be much more pared down, even though I really enjoy pared down work, but like the dynamism of it or the experimental nature wouldn't be seen as you know the right way to, to do it so that was part of the reason I, I sort of shied away from that I, I wanted that energy and I wanted to like keep that that excitement um, but what, what you mentioned earlier about having to read lots for the course I think that's interesting like break being able to break down fiction because again I never I, I didn't think about it that way I just wrote you know, I just kind of just got my ideas down. But then maybe, maybe if, I, if I was taught that, I might have been intimidated and thought, I need to get all of this right. Oh my God, I, I've only gotten this voice right and I haven't done characterization well enough. And that would panic me. So yeah, it's interesting. Like you can see the benefits of, of doing the course and, and getting that experience. But I don't know, I just, I really like the, like, the freedom of, of not having to do that. I was also wondering about the logic of um, somehow offering a university course or a writing course inherently has uh, a financial logic to it or a capitalist logic to it. You know, there has to be something tangible comes out at the end that you can use to get a good job or get promotion or such. So I'm wondering about how the logic of you've got to have something that comes out at the end that's a clear product, let's say clear benefit fits in with the freedom to just explore your voice and do something creative. And I also, I mean, I definitely think I have a lot to learn. I definitely think it would be worth me uh, working with a teacher or a very experienced writer. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if there's a difference between um, being taught on a course that starts at point A and goes through several steps and ends at point Z for everybody um, whether that's um, different to being on a course or being in a coaching setting, I'll call it for want of a better word, where it's really following your own trajectory, your yeah, your passions. Yeah. Can I just can I just add something really briefly to what you said when you talked about what you get out of it? I mean, there is a, a certain esteem actually. In, in the UK anyway, attached to like the UEA courses. And, and if you're looking to sort of further your career um, in publishing, it does, that access becomes slightly easier. So I know people who did that and got agents because agents are like introduced to them, you know, they come and hear them read, um, you know, editors come to hear them read. Whereas somebody like me, I, I struggled to get an agent for years. Um, that, that became quite difficult. But maybe if I'd done a UEA course, I might have had that access, which is what a lot of writers want. So, you, you, know, you know, that's what you get from it as well, as well as all the like... Yeah, because the, the UEA course, uh, it is the most prestigious course and they do have access to agents. And a lot of those students, they've published, I don't know, uh, a few years ago, it was 300 plus writers who have written multiple books each themselves. So that's how successful it is. The economic argument, spoken like a true African. <laughs> you are so African. <laughs> it's like accounting, law, medicine, you know. There, there is that to it. But the thing, the thing is, you know, I said transferable skills. Um, people study something that they really enjoy, that enriches them as human beings. Uh, and those, no, no, but, I but to my mother. I, will tell, I will tell that to your mother. But actually, but actually, it's, people say the same about English literature. And that's the reason why a lot of these courses don't often have a high percentage of people of color because they're coming from backgrounds where however many generations back, there were immigrants, <clears throat> they were struggling. And it was all about doing well in the society. So what do you do? You, st you study something that's going to have, give you a, c a clear financial and career path. So, yes. Yeah, so, so, but, but there is that argument, and that's what puts people off. But the thing is, if people want to really... If people want to do it, then we have to provide that surface. One of the things that's very interesting... Well, actually, I'll just pick up on what you said about your... Um, 
imagination being kind of constricted and so on. It all depends on who teaches you. I think that's what I was talking about. So, yeah, I mean, if I had done, if I had done the course, sorry, if I'd done the course and I'd gotten someone like you who like appreciates that kind I of, I would have allowed you yeah, to be or, even more or, twisted. Or, or Maggie, you would have encouraged that. I suspect we would have. Yeah, we would have. And then they would have been even more dark. And yeah. you know, I've had I've had students who have been taught by certain individuals who shall name, remain nameless, who have said, you, your fiction should not be set in a particular time or space, atemporal, um, aspatial, right? Because otherwise it limits it and people won't be able to relate to it. So I said, oh, you mean like Dickens, <laughs> right? So, so they are taught nonsense. Somebody else came to me and said that she was told that your characters either have to be a hero or an anti-hero. <laughs> What bollocks? What absolute bollocks? You know, that's textbook teaching. Um, so you are limited by the people who teach you. The other thing, the other thing that I think is a pitfall of studying creative writing, and that is that you, you end up writing for your peers. You know, especially when you go in at a young age, you know, your community initially are the students in your class who are probably about your age and their responses, because creative writing teaching is through workshops as much as anything else. So you're always getting feedback on your work and those voices are then starting to shape what you write. And I think that could be um, a problematic. One big issue, I think, is that there, we're even having this debate so why are we having this debate about creative writing when everybody accepts that all the other art forms are taught and have been taught and always will be taught? So why are we having it? Because it's, because it's a contentious issue still today. Does anybody? I, I think the thing with writing, there's very much a... Because I, I think I th this is probably why more of us write poetry than novels, partly because poetry, I would say, I mean... I'm going to contradict myself because from my point of view, actually, the less words you use, the harder it is, okay, is what I think. But the thing about a novel is it's time intensive. It's a very selfish and time intensive thing. So where do you get the right to actually section off a part of your life? It's, but you know, before you, nobody's going to give you any money for it. And you're going, oh, I'm going, I'm writing my novel now. And you know, what about the childcare? What about the dip? What about the that? It's to have the permission to spend that time on something that may earn no money at all is a really big thing. And, you know, I think in the past, people who have done that have been those who have extreme confidence in their place in society. So, you know, I'd, I'd say that's a very good reason for making sure people realise that you might have a really brilliant story and yours is worthwhile. And that's one of the important things about teaching creative writing. On the other hand, I've got the, you know, the, the little devil in me says, well, if you are going to need that amount of coddling, you know, you need to be a self-starter. You need to be, if, if you're going to get up, you know, if you've got to go to work at six, get up at four if you want to do it. Because, and the other thing about that is, I'm going off tangent again, because the only person who loses out if you don't do it is you. So, but what you're doing by giving people space is a really important thing. And you're right, because art school is exactly the same. You know, a foundation in Britain, we have a fa and actually I would argue that in an ideal world, creative writing should be involved in what is an art foundation course, which is, it's a one year, it used to be free, uh, post A level course where you, you get to try all different sorts of arts. You get to try sculpture, text, all that stuff. And then you do your, you choose your specialism after that year and you do your degree. And really, it's that kind of thing, you know, because how, how do you know? You might be the sort of person who's done a lot of writing on your own. These days, there's a lot of young people doing, you know, sharing stories. But there are probably people who aren't. It's like, how do you get to those people? How do you get those stories? Sorry, I've gone off. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point um, about the investment that you make on your own. You write the novel or you write the poem and it's just you and the paper or you and the pen, right? Um, and I was thinking about that too while you were discussing. I thought actually we wouldn't have this discussion about actors learning on an acting course. And I, I wondered if part of it is um, 
because um, I thought about that. I used to want to be an actress, and I used to want to um, work in theatre or, or work um, um, on film. And then I realized my fate as an actress would be so dependent on the visions of uh, what directors, casting directors, uh, members of the cast who I can or cannot get along with. Um, I, I deliberately made the decision to write. Originally, I wanted to write screenplays and then put myself in the lead role, you know. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I thought about that, and I thought maybe one difference is, is that writing is such a solitary commitment to yourself, which is where I agree with you, um, and who is going to tell me? Like when I first wrote um, The Things I'm Thinking While Smiling Politely, that was really just a challenge to me. I just decided I'm going to sit down and I'm going to pull together all these little bits of text that I've written, and I'm going to give myself a year to turn that into a novella. And that was just a commitment I made to myself. And I also, a little bit like, I think um, Nikesh was saying yesterday, was it Nikesh? Sorry, it might have been Hari. Uh, um, that it's about writing that story that you haven't read yet or haven't seen anywhere. I just thought, I want, I want this particular story. Um, and I sat down to write it. And I think it would have felt very odd to go on a writing course, to have someone who doesn't know that story to teach me how to write it. But yeah, I'm still thinking about it. I, think, I mean, I think... Um like I said, there is no right or wrong answer. It's just good to have the option there for, for writers, like find the route that works for you. It might be that you, you get really frustrated and lonely and isolated just doing it on your own, but being in that kind of course structure where you meet other students who have a shared interest and you have a tutor um, and you have assignments, you know, you are kind of in the space where you're learning the discipline and then when you finish from the course presumably you take those skills forward and you now have that discipline and can can continue with that you know should you wish to so so that's important learning the discipline because that can be that actually is like half the battle like you can have all the great ideas in the world and all the most amazing stories but if you don't actually sit down and learn to face the page learn to allocate time to do it Catherine you were talking about permission but actually force yourself to do that then how do you produce the work and maybe you know maybe that structure teaches you that you know, yeah, Catherine was talking about, you know, the MAs and, you know, if you, if you need to go on an MA, why don't you just go and write the book? Um, you know, there are some very famous writers in Britain who would agree with you, you know, who will say, well, you just do it, right? Um, the thing is, not every, and as you say, not everybody's the same. So not everybody has that self-starter engine in them or the confidence to just do it themselves. And they do need the support. And in fact, when people come on an MA, um, they, do, they don't usually complete a whole novel. So in my institution, they'll do 40,000 words or so, some institutions more or less. Um, but often they have written novels already. They have written novels. So they're not people who are coming... A, no, you don't do an MA if you're kind of like uh, had no experience of, of creative writing. You do an MA when you have had some experience. And often they have written novels. Often they've tried to get those books published and they realise that they need to kind of learn some basics, perhaps. And... Um, uh, you know, rethink how they write. And then often they do go off and they do write the books and then they do get published. It's interesting that you're saying this, Catherine, because the people who usually say it are men. Um, and they're, I'm not going to mention any names, there are two individuals who have been very public. Yeah. This is going around the world. Um, but who have been very public in their dismissal of creative writing as a taught subject. And both of them are incredibly privileged. One of them has got the most privileged kind of background. He's both of them teach creative writing. So they take the creative writing dollar, yeah. right? But they then slag off the subject. So, so one of them is, you know, his father was a professor. He's a very famous writer, um, related to aristocracy, went to one of the two elite universities in the country and thinks that people should just write. Yeah. Why, why should they go off? And when he gave a talk that I attended, um, he was saying, you know, I have a friend for the last 25 years. She has a cottage in Cornwall. And when I'm finishing a novel, um, I, uh, I, she allows me to go there. And I, I finish the novel, you know. I shut myself away and I just get on with it. I was like, wow, you are so out of touch. You are so out of touch with uh, most people. And I thought, you know, especially women. Women attend creative writing courses more than men, right? But more men, I don't think they get published more. 
So men do have something in them, an entitlement, perhaps a confidence, where they just, just go off and do it. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I was being devil's advocate, absolutely I for sure. I know you were. Oh, okay. So, you know. Um, and also, I'm jealous because I thought, oh, you know, I'd love to do MMA. I'd love to, do, you know, because you've got the permission to not do anything else because I feel very much, I feel exceptionally privileged in what I do. I feel like I'm really lucky when I look at, you know, what like my parents' generation had to do to survive. So I live in a, in a bubble of luck that I can do this job, that I can just about, okay, yes, it's, but it's writing. I might not just do books, but I can get along and I can feed my family and that is a massive privilege um, and obviously the thing about books is actually what we need you do need writers I mean it's different publication and writing probably different but what we need is readers I think I would like to be able to educate more people to be readers but actually that is what you're doing so thank you yeah one of the other problems with it is that um, because the academy is essentially white, certainly in the arts and humanities, I have heard of and encountered many times reading lists on creative writing courses, let alone the English literature courses. Let's leave that aside for now. Reading lists that are overwhelmingly white and male. So, so that's another problem with the subject. When you have people teaching it, you have mainly women who, who, are, who go on these courses, but you have people teaching it who are predominantly male and who have white male middle-class reading lists. And by that, I mean they will teach Julian Barnes and Ian McEwan and, and Kafka and whatever else. And the students, you know, uh, are not being um, introduced to literature that in any way reflects them, which goes back to what we've been saying um, throughout this seminar about the need to see the books out there that reflect people. And I've had students... Um, who've come from other parts of the world. My university is very multicultural, so they've come in from, I don't know, Malawi or Macedonia or wherever, and they're suddenly writing these very English stories. Or they're from Malaysia and they're writing English girls with blonde hair and blue eyes. And I say, why are you doing this? And they think that's what they have to do, because to, they're in Britain, that's what they have to write. And then I dig deeper and I discover that actually... If I get them in the third year, for the first two years, they haven't actually been introduced to much multicultural literature or, or, or novels by women. And that's a real problem in the academy that really needs to be addressed. I, I just want to say something that actually, when I do schools workshops, and I do a lot in London with, uh, the youngest is probably 11, and I'm working in schools that can be terrifically multicultural. In fact, you know, I work in, in areas of London for the library, so they put me in lots of different schools. So Brent, which is a very multicultural borough, and before, and before October half term, and one of the schools that came into the library to talk to me, they were, com they were completely, it was an Islamic school, it was a private school, so they were all incredibly bright, incredibly middle class. And we did writing, and all the characters they wrote about were English. I mean, I get this with all kids. You know, they do not write themselves in books. Kids, you know, how... So, of course, by the time they get to you, they're erased out, and this is now. So that makes a lot of sense, because they're not in the books that they're reading, so they think books have to be about... I think there's an article on that, on Media Diversified or so, about how people of colour writing stories about white people, because white people belong in books, and people of colour... Uh, you know, something else. And I was thinking about this discussion in, in context of my, um, my prize. I've just received a, a prize for literature in, in Germany, in the German language, I meant to say. It's a German language literature award. Um, and I think um, my story definitely, the story I've submitted is definitely completely out of the mould for many reasons. One of them being because I wasn't in a, um, I didn't receive any kind of training in uh, creative writing within Germany or at all. But with, within Germany, I think there's a very specific way of, of teaching creative writing. And uh, many of the stories uh, that were submitted this year and in the years past have sounded quite similar, have gotten, ha kind of felt very... I mean, I'm really overgeneralizing, um, and no disrespect. They sounded very serious and, you know, 
from the I perspective, uh, thinking about the world and philosophizing. And, and my story kind of was a bit out of the mold because it was so quirky and it was uh, using humor and, and confusion. So I think that people have said to me, um, oh, it's, it's good, or it's, it's good that there's a, a new perspective on how to write coming in, fresh wind or so. And I'm wondering if um, the problem isn't so much teaching, because I, I, I'm beginning to get a, an appreciation for why a creative writing course would be good. And as I said, I definitely feel I have a lot to learn. But whether it's um, whether the course that you're teaching, Bernadine, should be called Critical Creative Writing. Just to quickly pick up on Catherine's point before we move ahead. What you said about the kids. Um, so I, I agree that process has to start much earlier in terms of each introducing kids to characters of colour, but also not just children of colour. White, white kids should be reading, um, you know, multicultural books at, at that age, and it should be something that's, like, normal, the norm, and that, that, that I think that has to be encouraged. Um, so I have a friend who has um, a young son, and she, even if she has to order the books from America, she does that because she feels it's really, really important that he starts seeing himself reflected um, really, really early on, you know, because by the time he gets to, like, 12, 13, already, like, he's developed that, that notion of, of not seeing himself reflected, so it becomes a problem. But if it's done much earlier, that way we kind of nip the, the problem, you know, in the bud. But I think, like I said, not just children of colour, like, all children should be reading books like that with characters of colour. It's really important. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know what you mean by critical creative writing. I don't think anyone would turn up if we called it that. <laughs> Because it would just it would just uh, over intellectualize it, perhaps. Well, um, somebody once asked me about um, it's it's a little bit off the topic, but it's still related. Somebody once asked me about what do I think is the most important thing I can teach my children, um, and I said critical thinking, and I think it's this uh, way of not taking things for granted, but thinking about who benefits from what and and how are things presented to us, how are things structured, and how could they be done differently to reach people differently or new people or additional people. And I just had the feeling that um, we may be doing creative writing courses a disservice if we're putting them all under the same banner. You know, like you, you've you already mentioned that there are different approaches, there are different teachers and there are different styles of teaching creative writing. And okay, let's choose a, a sexier name, but a uh, critical creative writer, I could imagine, deals with, okay, what literature do we have available to us at the moment? What literature is being published? By whom? Where? Who gets promoted? Who gets translated? Link into the discussion yesterday. And how can we as writers change that? I think um, I haven't associated, for example, creative writing with politics or, or a political stance or, you know, and I, I find my writing very political. And uh, that would be a reason as well why I wouldn't know where to look if I wanted to join a creative writing course. Where would I find that aspect? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, when, you, when you have critical in, in the equation, I just think it then becomes, it's, um, it, uh, it dominates over the, I'm not putting this very well, but it dominates over the creativity. And what people are attracted to is the idea of creative, um, degree although don't forget that we've sort of been talking about degrees but actually creative writing in the UK is taught everywhere I, I set up an organization called spread the word over 20 years ago and they've been running creative writing workshops courses course of two days three days four days whatever uh, for these over 20 years now so people study it in all kinds of environments coaching mentoring I put under the umbrella of creative I came through spread the word you came through spread yeah, the word of great. creative writing teaching um, and just to make another point in America you know at the University of Iowa that's where creative writing teaching began in the academy. That was nearly 100 years ago now. In America, most writers, and you can't really say that American literature is homogenous or apolitical or anything, uh, most writers come through degrees and also teach on these courses. Most, most writers do. In the UK, we're increasingly getting there as well. I can't say in the UK that we're necessarily um, encouraging the student, students to be inventive and experimental and to think outside of the box, but that's reflected in what the industry is looking for, and the industry is quite risk averse. So, um, but yeah, but you know, you're talking about a course where 
the teaching is politically engaged and so on. But that's, you have to find the right teacher for that. So you, you look for the person who you think will offer you that. And sometimes a lot of universities do take on very famous writers, but they don't actually do any teaching. So you'll be attracted to that university because you like the writer, but actually you'll never see that person. I'd like to ask Malaika, because Malaika is a poet who's been teaching for like decades, I think, if she'd like to, to contribute. Malaika, do you want to come up here? Seeing as Harry has done a runner. <laughs> He's probably in a pub somewhere being philosophical. Yeah, he's, he's watching it, yeah, in the hotel. So, so poetry, which of course is your field. Um, um, yeah, I was there trying to say a lot. Um, one, um, I started to figure out that I wanted to be a writer. Um, and I was writing and performing and, um, and the feedback that I was getting um, I had no confidence. I had completely no confidence in myself as a writer. So when I presented my, my poems, it was just seen as this performative poem and you're a performance poet. And, and, and so I spent two years on every single course at Spread the Word. Um, I remember that. Um, and in hindsight, it's made me a really good teacher. It's made me a really good writer. It's made me understand genres, and it's able to enabled me. It's equipped me to be able to teach a lot of different styles of writing, um, and to, to so that that's the first thing I wanted to say. That um, that you know, if I read that early work, it was really it, there wasn't anything bad about it. It was just an early work of someone with promise, but I had no confidence whatsoever. Um, and I only stopped doing creative writing classes um, two years ago when I took my MA. There were times when I would every evening and every weekend I was attending creative writing, a creative writing class, a novel writing, a poetry writing, just because I had no confidence. So, so are you saying that you got that confidence from attending the, the courses yes, and having from that attention different, from, from, the a, from having that attention, from working with different people? Um, and the other things that happened is I, I didn't realize it, but I was building up networks within the industry and I was becoming quite well known within the industry. So in a way, um, a lot of people know me and people say, how does everyone know you? Actually, we all sat in creative writing classes together. Um, so I did city, I did spread the word classes. I did, um, centerprise. They were classes in centerprise. I did centerprise classes. I went on Arvon courses. I did one-off classes at city lit. Um, um, I just went wherever there was a create, and then after a while, I started to look for tutors. I started to think about who would teach me or who would help me develop. Oh, that person's teaching there, I want to go there. Um, so that was, and that's about, what, 15 years of going to creative writing classes. And when I did my MA in 2013, that's when I stopped attending creative writing classes. So that... So that was, that's really interesting um, because you wouldn't look at my poetry and say that that's the kind of confidence journey that I would have, you know. Um, I had 10 years of mentoring by Kwame Dawes where every time he came, I'd look at my poems and give them back to me. Um, I worked with Pascal Petit. I went to Art of the Tate. Cause, so anything that was work was, 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 you know, I would just go on it to find out how to work. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, that's what I wanted to... But you chose very well, didn't you? You chose, uh, I imagine that if you'd have gone on a course where you would have felt that your wings were being clipped, you wouldn't have stayed. Um, but, but just to say something else, um, what about you as a teacher? Because you've done so much teaching with, with children, but also with adults. Um, I think what I would advise creative writing, someone who's, going to, who's a writer who's going to teach creative writing, um, to do is I model myself on my best tutors and my best tutors are people like Bernadine and um, Kwame Dawes and Mimi Cavati and W.N. Herbert and why those people are some of the best tutors that I've had is that they're well read and they're so well read they're always trying to find new exciting stuff so when a student's come to you with possibilities um, you are trying to enable that student to develop their voice. You're not trying to put them into a bracket. So you might think, ah, oh, I don't know about graphic novels, but actually let me 
go and find out more so that I can enable this student. That's what makes the best teacher, because that's, that's the people who em empowered me. Um, it's seeing the possibilities within, and I think that's what creative writing should do. It should equip you with the techniques of writing, um, the toolbox, it's, it's like a craft, it's like a furniture person going to learn their craft and their graph. You can't teach that person how to build beautiful furniture that stands out from anybody else, but you can teach them the techniques and the structure and the tools, and you can also see the possibilities. You can see, ah, they're writing all this polemic stuff, but in the middle of it is this gem. I think there's a, they, they want to be a narrative writer. They want to be autobiographical. How can I encourage that in their reading? In, and, and, and how can I, I suppose for me as a creative writing tutor, it's how can I think, how can I get them to empower themselves? So how can I start suggesting books to them or suggesting reading that enables them to make, to then go off to make that journey? So you're really trying to support people on their journey in that. That's what I think. Have you had experiences where you've realised that students shouldn't be there, that they're unteachable, and that, you know, or, or not just that they're unteachable, but it's just not going to work for them for some reason? And have you personally had bad experiences in creative writing classes as a student? Oh, God, yeah. I've had terrible experiences in creative writing classes. Um, I've had experiences where um, people have been... Have been um, seduced by the, by the um, dialect or by the vernacular. And um, so instead of getting, f everybody else would get feedback on the line breaks or the, you know, and people would say, oh, when you did the vernacular or when, when the Caribbean voice was there, it was really musical and rhythmic and then it went and I don't know what happened. And I'd wait for anything else, like the line break or, or rhythm or, um, um, and I've had feedback on, on courses where um, people I respect would say things like, um, it's a performance poem, isn't it? Really. And I'd wait to hear what's happening on the page or the craft or stuff. And that's very demoralizing. Yeah. And I think that's why I stayed in courses for a long time. Because some, um, some students and tutors are not equipped. Um, I, think of, I think of students, I have a very kind of, there are people who, they are writers and they want to develop their craft. There are people who come on course and they're writers and they want to develop but they're not ready yet. And they're gonna go off and they're gonna go somewhere else and gonna do something in five years time, they're gonna come back. There are people who they've come on the course and they love reading. And actually what you're empowering them to do is to understand that writing is hard work and to understand how to be better readers. So I think I think about what, the, what, what, what is the, what is this, what is going to happen, what is that student's promise? Um, because it's like everything else. You're going to get people on a, who go on a, um, an English literature course or I went on, I went on a sociology course when I was doing my anthropology degree and there was no way. After about two weeks, after about two weeks I thought, God, anthropology is so exciting. This is boring me to death. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just all in Britain. It's just, no, 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 I need to go back where I'm around the world. So, you, you know, so that's kind of um, how I see it, that they're students, they're, they're there, and what is the possibility? So some people know they're, they're quite literal, but they learn they're quite literal. You know, they learn something in there. They learn, I'm quite literal, and actually I'm not. Um, and, and, you know, in City Lit, sometimes someone would, I would be, sometimes, sometimes I'd have a frank conversation with someone and say, have you considered the journalism course? Because they can write. Um, and they're like, yeah, I'm starting to, or have you considered script writing? Because um, yeah. the poetry, this is not maybe the right, uh, you're a good writer, but this is not the right genre for you. No. And I think that's what you're trying to do as a tutor. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, can I, sorry, sorry, I can I, sorry. Well, I think it's very important to find the right... I, too, when I started, I did a lot, a lot, a lot of courses. And especially if you're writing a particular sort of writing, I mean, I write for young people, the courses that didn't take, which if they were general or if they were for people who were writing adult novels because they had no idea of what you were trying to do. And I think whatever you're writing, you need to find your people, wherever they are and whoever they are, and your advocates. And I think however you do that... You know, that's important. So I was just going to say to Malika, I know you have, like, connections in America, like Kwame Dawes is, is based there, isn't he? And wh I was going to say, why do you think they have... Because you're really... I've known you a long time, and you're really big on craft. I mean, Malika's... 
poems are amazing, as you heard, but she works at it. And, you know, you are a craftsperson, you go at it, you break it down. Do you think that Americans are similar in that way too, that they are all about craft and that's why they study it, they see it as something to study and then, you know, get that confidence from, if you study the craft and you break it down, you know the tools, you know the techniques, then in a way that gives you that, that confidence that we were talking about that's so Yeah, important. I think so. I think I, I just felt like I wanted to, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm equipped, if I know what hammer, what's the right hammer to choose and stuff, then I'll, then then um, I'll feel confident. It was more about me. I, I didn't even know that I wasn't confident. I just knew I felt lacking. Um, I felt something missing. Um, when I, I mean, when I finally felt, and also there was a, there was a missing link. There was something that I couldn't figure out. There's something that no one was telling me what to do. And I think two programs did that for me. Complete Works did that because it provided us, it made me work with someone who showed me the notes and bolts that some of the confidence was not about the work, but about negotiating and traveling in the industry. Is that it's not, it's not a, I'm serious about this. It's not a hobby, but I don't know how to move from this place to the other place. It's an invisible ladder that no one explains how you can walk up and down. So that mentoring provided that space of what to do. How do you get published? How do you get, how do you, how do you get your poem done? How do you send out for submissions? Those nitty gritty things were missing. Um, and then um, I went to Carve Carnum in America. And, um, and what was great is that there, as soon as you went in, the first thing your, your, what whoever was tutoring you said is, you're meant to, and Mimi Cavati says this, look at the page, what is the poet trying to do? And are they doing it? Don't think about, is this poem representing this or replicating this, but what is that individual poem trying to do and are they doing it? And if they're not, what's lacking? Don't think about, oh, that poem is from, you know, South Carolina, I don't understand you know, the thing of South Carolina, um, the diaspora, this diaspora community, the, the black diaspora is, is quite a complicated one and they're different poetics. Um, and if you don't understand the poetics that's needed for this poet in the workshop, she's gonna be in your workshop all week. You need to go and arm yourself. So, you know, you had to write a poem every day in Carve Carnum. Every night you wrote a poem. But in the night sometimes, I was reading up on it. There was one person in my workshop who was an experimental poet. And I didn't know how to respond to her work. And, 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 and what they did is said, the onus is on you and a student as, as a fellow workshop to figure out how to empower your fellow writer. Um, and I think that's kind of like the best teaching I got in America, you know. Um, so we had to go away. And I, in the night, I was reading up about experimental poetry. What does that look like? Why are the spaces on the page? Why is this happening? Why does it look like a, a puzzle? Um, and so that we could go back and be empowered, but also so you could empower yourself. So I think that was some of the best. I think that's what I learned on the American landscape um, in Carve Carnum. And that's when I was just like, oh, I understand. Yeah. Um, so I'm very interested to know about creative writing in uh, Germany. Uh, what does anybody here know? What exists? Um, and also your responses to the workshops today that, that you took part in. And also, please feel free to ask us questions. Thanks very much. That was really fascinating. It has actually changed my mind about um, the topic, which is, I guess, what a you know, panel wants to achieve. I was, I was much more skeptical uh, in a cliched sort of way, and you've opened my eyes. But your question was, of course, what's the landscape in Germany? We've had um, Bernadine in Münster, I think, twice to do a creative writing course, and the students loved it. It's very hard in the German system, though, to introduce that in an, in an MA program that's not on creative writing at all. So to find the money and to get it accredited is difficult. And, you know, but one, before you do it, you don't even know, is it gonna work? Is it gonna fly? But it, you know, it didn't fly, it rocketed. You know, they, they always wanna, want, want us to bring you back. They want those classes and we just have to try and facilitate it. So I think it can work, um, but there are a lot of reservations in, in, in the German system um, because it's, you know, supposed to be academically rigorous and somehow we can't quite square, you know, how would creative writing as it's taught 
um, fit in, but it can. I think. But, but, but yeah. you have art schools and drama schools and other sure. dance schools, do you? Yeah, you're right. You're right. But I wouldn't know whether they whether plays plays are all there. I'm just saying, from within an English department, it would be very difficult to to introduce it. Um, but I now get the sense one could. You have to raise the funds to do it. We're the ones who write those courses. We just have to get them accredited, and why not have a module or two on creative writing in it? And the students feel it enables them, not necessarily because, or empowers them, as Malaika said, you know, not necessarily because they're toying with the idea of becoming creative writers. They'd probably not be at our department if they wanted to do that. But it makes them better readers of fiction, better readers of poetry, um, better theatre goers, you know, if they've tried their hand at it and they feel more confident amongst themselves, it changes the relationship to the other staff as well. So I think it's a brilliant idea and I'd, I'd be interested to hear what colleagues say about their departments. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Uh, gentleman over there. Actually, uh, <laughs> I would first of all like to pick up on that. Um, I also found it very interesting and learned a lot. Um, I'm not quite sure whether what I'm saying is really informed or just a, you know kind of uh, um, kind of guesswork. But what I remember from uh, Germany of of the let's say period of the Cold War is that there was a kind of you know understanding that in the GDR you had the Erich Weinert Academy, which was a kind of you know centrally uh, uh, um, governed body in which you had something like a you know a, a very rigorous system, but also very eff uh, efficient one. Um, to to produce, I mean, I, I mean, to to to, um, to to run creative writing in a, in a very systematic way, um, which of course, from a West German Cold War perspective, was always considered to be something that the enemy does, and that is something like doing violence to the arts in the sense of um, a deeply entrenched romantic understanding of writing coming in a kind of organic way from from within. Um, this has been, I think, upheld by this kind of, you know, competition of the two systems, where in Britain maybe there has been a kind of, you know, <laughs> more relaxed approach uh, even in the period that I'm speaking of. But I'm, to my knowledge, there's no equivalent in West Germany to, to, to this, uh, even though the Erich Weinert Academy has survived the reunification of Germany and is still going strong now uh, under slightly different, of course, auspices. Um, but the West German, and that means, I think, in, in, in post-reunification Germany, the dominant academic uh, um, system that we have has, ne has never really introduced academic writing in the same way that you have it in the, in the English-speaking world. What I was trying to say is maybe this has also that kind of you know, political uh, um, kind of deep structure or tradition. Sorry, can I just ask you, did you say that in East Germany, creative writing was taught, but in a very systematic way? Systematic and in a slightly, you could say, um, uh, uh, um, elitist way, almost. Uh, it was something what? like a, like an elite institution. Uh, it, w it was this one institution where you had, I don't know, 30 seats per year or so for you know, the whole GDR. And, um, and, and they would go there as students? Yes. They would go there to as learn students to write novels? Right. Exactly. And it was prescriptive, was it? They had to write certain. Well, I mean, yeah, it was, but it was also. I mean, that that many of the of the pretty well known GDR writers were formed there, and um, uh, in that sense, it's not like a like a. It's an ambivalent story that one has to go into a little bit more. And there's even one case that I think the very last uh, um, um, person who got enrolled in the in the Erich Weinert Academy in the GDR period was uh, Schernikau, who was a you know a person who migrated or who, who changed sides from West Germany to East Germany, um, and you know um, was I think one of the last uh, uh, people who really graduated from there under the old regime. That's very interesting. I didn't know about that. Yes, lady. Oh, a few hands up. Great. Uh, lady in the front, second row. Thank you very much. Um, I 
I, um, well, just to get back to uh, your question of how other um, institutes experience it, I used to work at the Center for British Studies at Humboldt University, and whenever we offered a creative writing course, we had the same, um, uh, well, experience that um, students loved it and wanted to explore, maybe also leave their comfort zones and see what they can do without like trying to become a full-fledged writer in the end. And I know that at the University of Hildesheim, uh, there is um, a professional um, creative writing degree as far as I know, that's the only one in Germany. And I was always... Okay, well, there is another one in Leipzig, I hear from Beck. Anyway. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I was just wondering if maybe some of it has to do with um, the German perception of, um, well, not so much of writing as a craft, but um, more as a talent thing. But um, again, that's just um, um, something I think maybe somebody else has a completely different op um, opinion. Um, I have a question to you, though. Um, I was wondering, well, we were talking about creative writing teaching, but I was wondering um, how, um, can you say a bit about the access to those courses? I think you already mentioned that a lot of them are quite expensive. I was just wondering, does that mean that um, in many of the creative writing courses you have more of the privileged kind of students? Um, and then also, who are the gatekeepers to those courses? Who decides who gets in? Um, do you have to provide some kind of writing before and do you have somebody who then decides if you can go on? Something I was really curious about. So you're talking about, are you talking about undergraduate or graduate level? Um, well, actually I didn't uh, think about this distinction before, but um, let's say undergraduate. Because That's undergraduate the... level, you know students now have to pay £9,000 to go to university, and I don't know if that's changed the demographic of students going to study the arts. I would suggest there might, there might be some shift. I'm not sure that I've necessarily recognised it at my institution. But in order to do an undergraduate degree at most universities in creative writing, uh, you need the grades. So you need the A-level grades, and then you are accepted. If you don't have the grades, they might accept you on the strength of other things, including perhaps a sample of your writing. In order to do a master's degree, which is cheaper, because it's usually a year, um, and less face-to-face uh, -face tuition, you need to submit a sample of your writing. And you're then taken in on the basis of that. Who the gatekeepers are, well, um, I think I said yesterday that the academy is mainly white, um, and also predominantly men. So I suppose they are the gatekeepers, sort of speaking generally. Um, yeah. But I don't know about... I, 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 well, I have, a, I have a suspicion that there aren't that many people of colour who take these degrees. That seems to be the problem. So, for example, at UEA, I don't think many people go and study at UEA, for example. I'm surprised by that. Um, which is why I think... Um, mentorship schemes are like a happy medium because they're usually free in London or the UK they tend to be if you have like a writing development agency and you're, if you're lucky enough to even have that in your region um, you can sort of tap into that and, and that's what I did so it was that kind of thing of okay I can study somewhat I can have that one-to-one -one, um, kind of tutorial with, with, a, with a successful writer who knows what they're doing um, but then I can also have that fluidity because there is that so we weren't meeting all the time, so we, we would meet like every three months. So my mentor was um, Donna Daly-Clark, who was great and very, very tough. So it was like an interesting combination of me, this like experimental writing, and then this very sort of tough men mentor whose writing style was completely different to mine. So that was really interesting. Um, but no, that, that worked for me. And I, like I said earlier, I would not have been able to afford um, a UEA at all. But there are lots of other like cheaper options like lots of short courses like there are loads of short courses that yeah. you can go on you know like for a week or two weeks or something so those are like fairly accessible you know if you if you can afford to I was going to bring up the short course. I was going to bring up two things, actually. I was going to bring up the short courses because I taught at City Lit for six years, um, and that's um, um, ways into creative writing and ways into poetry. And ways into poetry is it started off with, you know, is for you to come and try out poetry. Um, you can come for one term, the October term, and leave, or you can come and decide to, to stay for the whole year, so you just come back each term. And just making it the term, the term, kind of just teaching it so that it's progressively um, challenging for the people who stayed the whole year, but also that people who came in at an entry level could still um, have a beginning status, which was quite, it's really interestingly challenging. What I find problematic is um, I don't think 
that the English departments who embed creative writing into their, um, into their programs understand that some writers who are coming on creative writing classes, it's a development, it's a career development, it's a job development for them. And so they need to be aware of what's happening within the industry's marketplace. So my big problem um, as a writer of color, as an experienced writer going on to my course to do my MA, was their reading list. How can a, an, um, institutions who are in multicultural, situated right in the middle of multicultural areas, have completely white, middle class, men only? When a developing writer who's coming on, if you're coming on to do an MA and you're investing in that, you're reading, you're reading contemporary writers, you're up to date on what's happening, you're, you know, you're coming to things like this and being exposed and you're discovering Sharon, you know, um, and you go back into your institution and you're reading Kafka um, and you're reading and you've got a reading list that's not reflective. So that's my, usually my disappointment is that um, I'm here for, I'm here doing an MA as a career development, as something that um, I, I want these people who are experts to be well read and to facilitate my reading, to challenge me to find things outside of what I know. And actually, they are taking me back um, to, you know, centuries. So that, that's, that's one of my challenges in terms of that, you know. There was uh, some more hands up. So the gentleman here. Yeah, thank you again for, for being here and sharing your experiences. Um, uh, I was wondering, um, for me personally, I'm German, but yeah, person of color, so to speak, and I, I want to ask a very general question about yeah, the empowerment, the, the permission to, to write or yeah, to have a voice, because actually here also the, um, yeah, it's a diverse, it's called diverse voices, but if you look at the audience, you see, yeah, the predominantly white audience talking about literature and stuff like that. So, um, and also the German literature here, um, for me, for example, I was uh, in school or in university never encouraged to, to, to read something because I was, wasn't reflected. I, I was like bored. I, it's, German maybe Brecht a little bit because he was very dope, but the rest, um, I don't know. So that's, that would be, because Germany is very different from the UK, also the identity problems. So if I have to yeah, um, fight for my identity every day, how can I have um, self-confident even to write? Or that, that would be, that's, that's kind of a, a problem I always have. Thank you. There's a quote by uh, a wonderful man, writer called Robin D.G. Kelly, who said something like, we are not only the consumers of our culture, but we are its makers. And I found that really inspiring um, because, of course, the situation is as you've described. And um, there were, I mean, it's true about of course, it's true about the reflection. When I, when I read, I uh, very often, or when I read in the past, especially German literature, I very often didn't see myself reflected in the literature. This is a given. I, I still loved German literature, however. I, I, re I read German at university. Um, and I found some of the authors inspired. I also find Brecht dope. I like, yeah, I'm with you on that. And so I thought about Brecht, and I thought, how would Brecht sound if he had been a black woman, black British woman, a black British woman living in Germany, you know? And um, there were things that I learned from Brecht um, just through reading him or watching his plays on stage, which I tried to replicate in my writing. Um, and I think we, I'm wondering if talking about can creative writing be taught and, and focusing on the industry and becoming a, a professional writer is just one side of the discussion. Um, and the other side of the discussion could be um, just writing because you love the act of writing and writing for yourself because you want to read something that is a lot of fun to read or, or um, really inspires you. I also wrote, to be honest, because um, there were some 
in, in, in the year that I challenged myself to write the no novella, I had just come out of some traumatic experiences, some things that happened um, in my professional and personal life where I thought, wow. And I, I wanted to process those emotions. I didn't actually, by the way, the things I'm thinking while smiling politely is not an autobiography. I'm always asked this. So don't go away and think that that's what happened to me and that's why I wrote about it. But I was processing the emotions of what had happened to me and I found it a really healing experience to write. And I, I have the suspicion that part of the reason why people enjoy reading the things I'm thinking is because it it comes through that it was there was no pressure on me at all I just could do what I liked with the story I think I'm in a different position now I have a, a position of responsibility now I feel that but at the time when I was writing the things I was completely free nobody knew who the hell I was I didn't think maybe two people would read it and that would have been nice um, and I think that that's um, an aspect to think about also when we're thinking about can creative writing be taught, I think, yeah, who are we writing for? What's our motivation to write? Um, why do we want to learn to write? I think those aspects play into it. Okay, so who is it? The lady, yeah, the lady is third row back. Hello. Um, yeah, I wanted to say two things. Firstly, I translate a lot of uh, websites for universities here, um, German academic institutions that teach art, dance, all kinds of things. And I'm always interested by their wording when they write their mission statements. It's, it's often stressed that they are, uh, they have a, they use the word um, Wissenschaft, which is a really hard word to translate. But you know, I'm always asking them, do you mean hard science or soft science? I mean, what do you mean exactly when you use that word? Um, because they seem to be at pains to stress their academic background when they're teaching art subjects. So I think that that's quite an important aspect in German universities, uh, which may explain why in creative writing, when it's taught that... It's, it's a huge leap of faith to pay someone to come in to do something which is essentially not measurable you know, in its effect. Um, and it's not quite clear what's going to happen with that kind of uh, teaching or coaching. That was just a sort of random thought I had when you were talking. And the other thing, as it, I didn't realize that the Erich Weinert Institute was the Leipzig School of Writing. <laughs> because I um, actually translated a passage from Schernikau, and it's fascinating. Uh, he's a fascinating writer, East German writer. He actually was uh, kidnapped uh, by his mother <laughs> at the age of six and taken to Hanover from East Germany and then defected back to the East. Uh, I think he became a East German citizen in September 1989, right? And so, uh, I mean, he, he had, I think he had a month... <laughs> He had a month left of, of divided Germany or something. And he was told he had to go back to the East because that's the only place where there were writers. And um, you couldn't ever say that his writing is programmed or programmatic or... I mean, it's unbelievably experimental. So I, despite the academic contact, content of that course, whatever that was, I mean, he was one of the, he's one of the most experimental writers I've ever read. I mean, really far out. Um, and the third thing I wanted to say is I think that there's a huge diversity in Germany, uh, in Berlin, I can't talk about Germany, but in Berlin of uh, different connections between writers, translators, and uh, that, that it's quite a, they're all quite sort of on, a, on an equal level or that there doesn't seem to be any uh, like big rivalry. In fact, it's a huge solidarity and support and I've had incredible support from people here. And... Um, that the, the, the English community here seems to be also uh, quite uh, supported. Um, you know, I mean, we put on a small uh, open mic event, which is uh, basically just a place where people can read their work, and and we we kind of stress that it shouldn't be something finished and polished, but it should be a place where you can get feedback. And I'm, I'm really interested in any ideas from the panel that you could give for how to host that in a more effective way because you know I'm often extremely uh, uh, have a big uh, inhibition to, to comment on somebody's work especially when you know how much uh, uh, somebody has to go through to stand up and actually read it uh, and it was very humbling this today in the workshop to realize how you know sometimes it's just not the right moment or whatever so any any suggestions uh, from the panel um, on how to 
treat somebody's work when you hear it, you know, for the first time? Yeah, one of the things that I always teach, used to teach as queer city lit, is how to give feedback. Um, and um, and one of the things I would say is that feedback in a public in, in environment is really hard um, because that person's just come off stage and their ego and their, their adrenaline and everything like that. Um, the, 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 the thing is that you are the eye of the writer and people assume that the writer knows what works and that all they have to tell the writer is what doesn't work. Sometimes the writer doesn't even know what works. So actually, what, you, what, what, what one needs to, is that you're a mirror if you're feedback in reflecting. So what you're reflecting to them is what works, what, what holds it together, what shows a bright light, what shows a bright spark. And once you've done that, and that person can, can see that reflected in the work, then you can uh, maybe have one or two comments about what could be improved, or what could be developed, or what, and it's language, what could be further developed, or this raised the question for me, what are you trying to do here? So it's a conversation as opposed to a didactic, this is what you do. So that's an interesting way. Um, another thing is that you could hold workshops where it's a safe space to have that, so people come through the open mic and go on the workshops because then you can, that can be a safe space. But the, 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 the and that's why I started Malika's Poetry Kitchen because the, sp I, I would, you know, people would come to me after that and be like, yeah, that's, but you, and then people wouldn't talk to me for months. Um, and then I wanted to understand what was happening with that and it's that vulnerability and adrenaline and scared and you've just been trembling and you've never had someone say something and the first thing someone says is, um, you know, I don't know what that character was doing, you need to sharpen that character and all you hear is rubbish, 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 rubbish. So it's being mindful of that. I think hopefully that's helpful. Or you could, or you could swap it around and do the workshop and then have the open mic, because then what you've done is you've created that safe space you mentioned, and already within that workshop framework, they've gotten used to receiving advice, so by the time they go on stage, they're even a, a bit more confident, and what you do is you make, it, you make the fact that they've gone on stage like quite a big deal, but that's quite a big thing to overcome, so then they've done it once, and they can carry on doing it you know, again. So I think kind of just playing around with the format and seeing what works and what people respond to is, um, is a good way to go. I think, I think we have two and a half minutes left. Um, <laughs> I'm a very good timekeeper. Uh, Elka? I just wanted to add on the creative writing uh, situation in Germany in doing some research for the seminar. Uh, we were looking at creative writing courses uh, at the further education um, uh, schools here in Berlin and uh, there are lots of courses actually. It seems to me that creative writing is really very much embedded in the Volkshochschule network um, all over Germany and it's um, a much safer and more accessible space in these Volkshochschule ra uh, rather than at the university, of course, which is much more elitist. Uh, so it, it exists and it's, it's huge, actually. It's uh, just not um, on the academic level. I think it's, it's probably less visible than it was um, uh, shortly after Malcolm Bradbury invented it. Mm. Uh, yes, just quickly. I also wanted to comment on the, the fact that uh, Berlin as a city has become an MA course in a lot of ways, that people come <laughs> from America and from the UK because it's, it's, it's cheaper than 9,000 pounds to live here for a year or for the, a summer, which I would, I would recommend just the summer and skipping the winter. Um, uh, and there's, there's really great reading, so Lucy's reading um, uh, series is great. There's all kinds of open mics. Um, there's an organization called The Reader, which I hope you also found in your research. Um, uh, creative writing courses by wonderful writers like Claire Wigfall and Donna Stonecipher and, uh, and poetry and drama and fiction. Um, lots of bookstores, great little magazines. Um, so uh, <laughs> I, I would generally um, recommend Berlin as a creative writing course in itself. That's great, that's great, thank you. And just one quick question from a lady at the back. Uh, hi, so I did my undergraduate as a creative writing major in America, 
And I first wanted to say that I think Malaika has it exactly right, at least in terms of the program I did. It is very craft-based, and it's a lot of, as you all said, like giving us the tools and then letting us take that where we will. Um, and I was surprised that you didn't seem to have the same feeling about UK programs in creative writing, at least at the university level. Um, and maybe I just was blessed with an incredible program. Maybe it's just my university was really good. But I found that I was given a lot of space to grow and change and access to a lot of really valuable writing. And I don't feel that I ever had the impression that my wings were being clipped. And I was wondering if there was a difference in structure in the creative writing education in the UK that might uh, explain some of those differences. I, I'm, I'm sorry that you got the impression that we were saying that about creative writing degrees, because I'm not saying that, really. Okay. I'm saying that there are pitfalls always, but it depends on who is teaching the course. It's as personal as that. And I think that hopefully a lot of courses, I don't know, I only know what I teach, but hopefully a lot of courses provide students with the things that you say you got in America um, in order to, to grow as a writer. I was saying the same thing, I, that, but that was in response to some of the things that I encountered that didn't work. But overall, my creative writing workshop was a really brilliant experience. Um, and I got to, you know, work with a foremost Caribbean expert on, you know, um, gender and Caribbean writing and also some great tutors. And what I loved about my course is that um, it wasn't just one genre. So I was in workshops with novelists and short story writers and, um, and, 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 and everybody was quite rigorous. Um, my only kind of thing was always about the reading list. Um, yeah, yeah I, I definitely agree about the reading list. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we're going to finish there. Thank you very much for attending. And it's been an absolute delight for me to talk about this with all these writers. First time we've done it. We don't generally talk about this subject, do we? It's, 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 you know, it's, it's very invigorating and interesting to hear everyone's perspective. So thanks very much. And we'll see you um, when uh, I come back with Catherine Johnson, who's having her session later. Thank you.